Hi, my name is Rémi Balduc, and uh, I will now start a new series on saxophone. I have been doing videos on improvisation, but I thought it was time to talk about sax. Uh, I will start with uh, sound, and uh, there is quite a few exercises I do, uh, long tones, overtones, attack, different intervals, and uh, stuff like this. I will start by talking about the long tones. Long tones, we're referring to uh, when we hold the note and uh, do a crescendo and a decrescendo on it. And the idea is to be able to control your sound in the different dynamics, either soft or, or loud. Often the tendency would be when you play soft, you, you sound sharper. And then when you play loud, you go flatter. So the pitch change and also the timbre uh, probably get uh, brighter when you get louder. So you know, you can use those exercises sometime to find the sound that you prefer on your horn. Let me, uh, I'll start by making one long tone on a G and I'll give you some ideas about that afterwards. Okay, so first thing I would uh, that I find is important is to find where's the beginning of your sound. What is the optimum position you can have so you don't lose air and uh, this way you have more control over the sound. It's easier to play in a way. And uh, so what I do, I used to practice this. You just blow air on the horn, in the horn like this. So no pressure at all, just free blowing air. And then you start to give more pressure to that air with the diaphragm, maybe give a little bit more pressure with the lips, just hardly at all. And uh, basically try to find where there would be a sound in there like this. Now I hear a hint of a sound. So what I'm going to do once I hear that sound, I will concentrate all my my air and my uh, the where I blow my uh, my air with the diaphragm and the pressure I have also on the mouthpiece, so I get a cleaner sound. I basically basically uh, will think uh, about the sound itself and try to make it clean and see what happens like this. And that would be the beginning of my sound. This is much harder to do, of course, if you do it in the bottom, in the high. It's like a Dalu B flat. And that would be kind of the beginning of the sound. There is more air in there, of course, because it's like a, a low uh, note. But once I get that feeling, then I do a crescendo. I mean, if I don't, if I'm not able to do this, I can still do a crescendo. Then you just start as soft as you can and don't use any tongue. Don't start like this. You want to start with air. And I'm just going to do a crescendo and talk about it. So I'm finding the beginning without going, I'm going with a shortcut. So when I do this, I'm sending more and more air. So my air, when there is more of it, have more, it give more pressure on the mouthpiece. So one problem sometimes players have is that when they play live, they feel if they're they're not loud enough, they start pushing, and pushing, and uh, what happens? It's like you uh, the reed get overwhelmed with pressure. For instance. If I exaggerate this, I'm going to do a crescendo and push. I could not go any louder here. And uh, the sound became really more dark and uh, 
muffled, you know, and uh, because the reed had too much pressure. The idea is that when I'm doing a crescendo, I am relaxing, I'm not pushing. I don't need to push. There is more air. So the, the air that I'm sending, the extra air, replace me, the pressure I'm giving. So I'm, I'm letting it go. Uh, as far as the diaphragm is pushing, the feeling is that it's a feeling of letting go. And uh, also, I, I, uh, yeah, I release a bit the lips. I don't give more pressure. I release a bit. Sometimes to get the right feeling. I have students doing this. As you do a crescendo, as opposed to push, physically move forward, that gives you the feeling of pushing. I'll go back like this. And then just open up. When I do a decrease and those the other way around, there is less and less air, so I need to push it. Think about the water holes. You have a lot of water, say, and then when you turn the water down, the water, as opposed to go straight, start to go down. There is not enough pressure. What you do, you put your thumb on the holes, and this way you get more pressure. The thumb make the opening of the hole smaller. By being smaller, the water go faster. So when I'm playing softer, I want there is less water, the water is the air, so there is less air, and I want the opening to be smaller so it goes faster. That's my tongue. My tongue goes up. By going up, it makes the opening smaller and then the air go faster. So when I go loud, maybe I'm thinking something like, ah, oh, but when I go uh, soft, then I go, e, I, you know, so that's one thing I'm doing when I'm doing, say, a decrescendo, and of course, I mean, uh, the other way around, when I do a crescendo, e, yeah. Yeah. Uh, another thing too is like let's say uh, when I'm doing a crescendo, I'm giving less pressure, and uh, when I do a dec uh, decrescendo, a little bit more pressure. When I'm doing a crescendo, I'm thinking back, and when I'm doing a, cres a decrescendo, I'm thinking forward, like this. Uh, also, I would, uh, as far as pushing, when I'm doing a crescendo. I'm thinking about releasing the pressure of the diaphragm, but when I'm going softer, I'm, I'm giving more pressure again to compensate for the fact there is less air. Let me do a decrescendo and I'll be going forward. And I'm exaggerating the motion. Of course, I'm not going like this when I play necessarily. <laughs> uh, so that's how I work on the on the long tone, pretty much. And uh, the idea is like now, what note do I use? You know, which note should I play a uh, long tone on? On I mean, I could do uh, every note, and that would take. Uh, quite a while and that's possible I used to do that sometime but nowadays uh, I decided to play specific notes one advice I would have is that uh, you listen to great videos there is great videos online and you can buy videos as well Jerry Berganzi great tenor player uh, have a series of videos on sound on mod piece on embouchure you know uh, how where to put the read the non embouchure where you don't go like this yeah just like a regular natural position of the horn. I mean, I do that. David Lehman have great video, a great video on sound, uh, really uh, good, a lot of exercises in there I used. And uh, come, that was uh, dedicated to Joe Allard. And uh, there is a lot of great thing from Joe Allard technique that I use because I used to, when I was younger, I studied with players that studied with Joe Allard. So I had, you know, uh, some information about that and then as you get older you start to develop your own routine but those things stay as far as the technique so just being relaxed and not to, you know the way you use the embouchure and whatnot so one thing i do uh myself i i look at my horn it's good to know what is what notes are sharp what notes are flat you know uh, to know what's going on on this horn and in my case the low g is one of the well the low d is, is maybe the note that is the more flat on my horn, and the low G. But I use the low G to tune. I find the low D is a little too flat to use it as a reference point. The G is flat, but, you know, a good, like, not too flat. And uh, so I use the G and uh, to tune, because it's easier to lower the pitch of a note, let's say a high D like this, 
on doing that with the mouth, I can go down a major third, but going up, I can't really go that much high. So if I tune on the note that is flat, I cannot really raise it that much. So I'm taking one of the flattest notes, my G. Then if I raise it, I'm like, oh, I'm a little sharp. So I can use that as a reference point. Because then if that note is a little sharp and everything else is going to be crazy sharp. And I'm always pretty much at the same spot with it because being a flat note, I cannot really be more relaxed on it. I just have to push it a bit up. So that's one thing I do for tuning. Okay, another thing, when I looked at the different note and the way they were as far as pitch, uh, I made a series of notes that usually alternate between a note that is flat and a note that is sharp sometime an altissimo note to a really low note and whatnot. So this way I have a series of notes that's quite difficult and I figure if I can do long tones on those and just play that series and make it sound good in, in tune, then it will be much easier to play anything else. I find when you play all in the bottom, you have a certain position, then as you do your long tone going up, you adjust, but you're not going from one to the other. So I felt that going from one to the other was kind of a shortcut and made my practice a little a bit maybe shorter, but uh, more effective for me. So the note series goes like this. So it's not an easy series of note. And uh, I did use a bit, uh, sometimes I use some fingerings, uh, different fingering, alternate fingering on some note. For instance, the high C on my horn, I tend to put those three fingers down or with the C. Uh, sometime with the C sharp, a high C sharp, I'll put the F down. And uh, with the middle D, that tend to be sharp, I can put the side D. Or sometimes the low B to be more in tune, it depends. So when I do my long tones, uh, I do sometimes use the alternate fingerings. And uh, when I do my technique, my scales and whatnot, then I don't use it, you know? So I do a bit of both. So the series of notes I was playing here, I can use it and do long tones on them, one after the other. This way I get used to each one of the, the note, the register. And uh, generally, if a note is sharp, say my middle D being a sharp note, you tend to want to uh, to lower your tongue towards, uh, so you go towards, say, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, those sounds, as opposed to e, you know, uh, because the e sound will raise a pitch, because you you're putting the air faster when you do a e. So let's say my middle D being sharp, if I just play without moving anything, so it's sharp. So if I'm thinking you or uh, as opposed to we I do uh, e. I mean of course when I do e I tend to put a bit more pressure so I you see that difference in the pitch that's pretty much the tongue but when I play high B if I do ooh, it's really flat so on that note I need to think e so from D to B, I'm going ooh, E. And that's, you know, it's part of the horn. I mean, this is like an old horn from the 50s. And it has that tam timbre. It has that timbre, you know, uh, where you have different tone on different register. And I, that's why also I do that series of notes. I'm going from a D to a B. So I got to adjust and just develop the reflex to go to that note. Uh, so that's the way I work on uh, on long tones. Another thing, maybe another exercise is to air push. And this is something that uh, flute players practice, I believe. Uh, you might say, play flute and take a low note, and then you give air push. <sighs> See if you don't go up the octave. On the sax, it sounds like this. I'll go really soft, then give her air push. <laughs> So when I do this, it's only my diaphragm giving a shot, you know, I'm not using any tongue. And the idea, you want to be able to get back 
at the beginning position as quickly as possible and not do more like this. This, this is helpful. It helps you. It's like a really fast crescendo because I can do it and then stay loud. Sorry. And, uh, and also, it's really useful in jazz because sometimes you do need those air push. I'm going... I mean, this is another thing I don't want to get into phrasing right now. But this exercise in itself is quite good. Uh, and that's something I would use. And uh, just to conclude this video, uh, the next one I will be talking about overtones and uh, give you exercises on the overtones. So that was the long tones. There is different way to do them. I mean, some players just play on the horn, you know. Uh, I heard Joe Lovano saying for him a long tone, just take the horn and play, you know. Uh, as far as sound itself, uh, I'm, I guess my belief is that we each have a sound the same way we each have a way of talking and we don't try to change our way of talking. Of course, I'm not going to talk like this or like this, you know, like I have a way of talking. That's the way I'm, I'm talking. And uh, so the sound, we have it. Uh, we just want to have enough, if you want, technique so we're able to produce it without, you know, hurting yourself and and feel that the sound is being squeezed and not naturally uh, let out on the, of the horn. So I don't try to change the sound that's coming out of somebody's horn. I'm just trying to help them to produce it without much of an effort, you know. So those exercises I'm talking about won't change your sound. You still have the sound you have, but with a better uh, control of it. I mean, some players do change sound and hear a sound, want a different sound, and that's fine. In my case, I never really, uh, that was not one thing I was trying to do. I just always try to control my sound and then, you know, have the sound I have and just accept it and figure that's my voice, you know. So that's one important thing. And then uh, there is, if you check out, as I was mentioning, the video, David Lehman video, and some ideas about Joel Art's teaching, sometime to see how you control the horn, there is a bunch of exercises. For instance, if somebody is too tight on his embouchure, like say, then you ask, you ask someone to play a low G, say, and say, put the octave key on, and it would sound like this. You know, I'm putting it on. But if I keep, I play a low G, not only the fingering, but my whole body is playing the low G. Then I'll put the octave key on. Of course, the change, the timbre change because there is a, a key that open. But if I really, you know, I'm really on that note, I can put the octave key in the, the pitch gonna stay. I mean, the note gonna stay low. And the same way, same thing if somebody play a bit more like a boat. You say, okay, play now second octave, like a high G or a high D, say high D, and take the octave key off. They can do it because, again, they're not really playing the D, they're just fingering it. So the idea you want to be able to play high D. And remove the octave key and it stays there you know so this way you control the horn sometimes for fun i'll play where uh so i'll play a bit and when i'm playing low i'll play with the octave key when i play high without it it sounds pretty awful but uh it just you know gives you a sense of where you should be placed because afterwards it's much easier when you take it out and uh, so there is a lot of those type of exercises that comes from Joel Art, bending notes. Sorry. And stuff like that, or moving up uh, from a C sharp up with the, uh, the palm keys without changing the pitch. You know, and even randomly. Because my 
mm. alt is telling my horn this is a C sharp, or playing a high D with a high D sharp with a low B. That's an overtone, and then this is something I'll cover more in the next video. And I'm playing a chromatic scale now, uh, and I'm gonna try to keep that pitch. Stuff like that, you know. So you want to control the horn in a way, play the note despite the horn, like make the horn sometimes a bit your enemy by doing things on it that make it harder to get those notes out. And then that just gives you a better control of the notes. And of course, when you play the right fingering, everything becomes much easier. Uh, so that concludes that video over overtones. And uh, if you have any question, go ahead. Please like the video. You can share it. Be happy to. This is something like a, a gift. If you want, I give to the community. I teach at McGill full time and I figure in the summer I have a bit more time maybe I'll share some of my knowledge and there is other ways to do things and this is uh, again some ideas and the next video I'll talk about uh, overtones so this is Remy Brodzik from Montreal have a nice day